Bellerín, otro defensor, otro disparo, Monreal, gol. Marca el futbolista español, marca Nacho Monreal. Pim, pam, pum. This is Arsecast Extra. Hello and welcome to another Arsecast Extra, as always, with James from Gunner Blog a little bit later than usual on a Monday, but good afternoon to you, James. Good afternoon to you, Andrew. How are you doing? I'm all right. How was your weekend? Yeah, it was nice. Thanks, man. I've just got back. I was at the seaside in Whitstable in Kent uh, for the weekend, and it was lovely. Mm. Sunny. Seaside. I like it. Yeah, out of London. Lovely. How was yours? It was okay. Well, I mean, we've had, we've got some amazing weather going on here as well at the moment. It's yeah. really, really warm. So I basically sat in the back garden and uh, ended up drinking too much wine to the point where I woke up this morning questioning my will to live. Um, mm. But there you go. Lucky we did an afternoon podcast, Andrew. <laughs> yes. It certainly we've done enough it. questioning our will to live on the podcast recently. We didn't need more of that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, look, I came up with a good answer in the end, so it's fine. I'm here and, you know. <laughs> it was a positive answer. <laughs> just about, just about. But there were moments where I, I, I was thinking, nah. Teetering. Yeah, 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 yeah. But no, it's all it's all good. So, yeah, uh, I'm well and hope everybody out there listening is well and has decompressed a little, I think, um, given that it's an interlull and there hasn't been a great deal of Arsenal going on. And I think... Maybe we said this last week, or maybe it was something that we talked about on the on the Arscast on Friday. Just you know, the interlull has come at the right time for everyone. I think just to sort of step back, breathe a little, and just you know take stock, relax a bit. That's all. And also, how can you say, Andrew? It's not been a, a lot of Arsenal news. You're forgetting our four nil friendly win over Brentford, of course, the second leg from the opening day of the Premier League, the 4-2 aggregate win now, and star of the show, Cedric Suarez with a brace. Uh, it is feels like an alternative timeline that, that we've yeah. lapsed into, doesn't it? But yeah, look... Uh, I was I was quite surprised the club even sort of publicised it. Do you know what I mean? Because the replies were so underneath their tweet saying Arsenal beat Brentford four 0 was so uh, vicious. I was like, in the are they, but let's keep those things behind closed doors in a way. I, I I I get it. Yeah, absolutely. Like the timing of it. I mean, I think it depends on your state of mind when you're reading the tweet that they put out. I think the yeah. tweet, the tweet was fairly innocuous in that it said. We beat Brentford 4 0 in a behind closed doors friendly today. I think that's probably as much as it said. But depending yeah. on the mood certain people were in, and at that point it wasn't a great mood, it was as if, you know, they had <laughs> had an open top bus parade and said, We beat Brentford 4 0 today. We are the best. And, you know, the reactions, I think, you know, I understand why the replies were salty to say the least. Salty to say the least. But listen. Great news. Great great to hear Cedric Suarez has finally found his, his goal-scoring boots again as well. Um, mm. Again. No, I mean, yeah. I, I, <laughs> listen, I mean, that was the some of the Arsenal's run in the past week. I also well, no, no. actually watched... Go on, sorry. Oh, go on. No, what no. are you going to say? Well, I was going to say that there was, of course, a, a, an actual win for, for Arsenal women yesterday. 3-2 win over Chelsea to kick off yeah. the new Super League uh, campaign. A really big win. First win for the new coach. At the Emirates uh, Stadium as at well. At the Emirates Stadium. Um, yeah, I mean, was that what you were going to mention there? 
I did see bits and pieces of that. I was actually going to say that I caught uh, the second half of the England game. Oh, yesterday. lucky you, lucky you, yeah. Yes, yeah. Bakayo Saka though getting his birthday goal, which I did enjoy. That was good. Uh, quite an easy header from a corner, wasn't it? I watched it this morning on the on the internet. Found an illegal stream of the goal. Not a guy you associate with scoring headers, I have to say. Um, has he scored a couple for us? Or at least he? one, maybe? Maybe one. I've got a, a, a faint recollection of it. But yeah, he does all right. He does okay on it. Is there a website which tells you... I mean, there's so many stats out there these days, and I know we can, you know, mm. dig around. But the is Premier there a League website? website tells you if, if it's a Premier League goal, they uh, divide goals into right foot, left foot, and header. Okay. Um, but I don't know beyond that. Probably someone, you know, transfer marked or someone mm. like that. They probably do. Anyway, I'm not going to look at it now. Um, but yeah, good for him. And he's 20 now. That's good. 20 is better than 19. I think, personally. From personal experience, I found 20 better than 19. Yeah, it's interesting on 20, because they were like, he's not a teenager anymore, but he's not really a grown-up, is he, at 20? So what are we calling him? But, I mean, he can do all the things that an 80-year-old can do, and better. <laughs> and more, yeah. I imagine. I mean, he's much more mobile. He can go up and down stairs. Yeah. yeah, maybe he is a grown-up. Maybe that was. Maybe I'm patronising him. I think you are. But mm. inadvertently, I think there comes a point in your life where you realise, hang on a minute, you know, what? when you're a kid, you're like, oh, well, uh, the grown-ups will fix this. And then something happens at one point in your life and you go, hang on a minute, I'm the fucking grown-up here. I have yeah. to do this. That's a terrible realisation, I have to say. I think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's basically defined by when you stop listening to new music. I think <laughs> there's like a point, like maybe around 30, or, you know, where it's like, oh... I just don't know what, what the really young people are listening to anymore. Yeah. I'm not speaking for everyone, but... No, you know. no, no, of course. I mean, nowadays... There I are turn still the, cool people. I turn the radio on sometimes, and it's playing whatever popular music that's on, yeah. and I, I sometimes can only last about two seconds. <laughs> and then there's this moment... Do you, do you ever get this, like, the most delicious silence when a song is on the radio that's really irritating or really annoying and whatever it is and you push the button on the radio it turns off and there's just this like silence which is impeccable it's yeah. just it's beautiful like it's a pristine silence yeah I love it I love that uh, I, <laughs> I think that's when you're a grown up, yeah. basically. <laughs> I that, think so. that feeling there. I think so. Um, yeah, but look, uh, big shout out to the Arsenal women. What a big, big yeah. win that was. Beating Chelsea, who, as we know, as we know, are a terrible, awful bunch of people in whatever format they come in. Men, women, mm. all of them. Uh, apologies <laughs> to your brother, I know. But still, you know, no mercy. No, I couldn't agree more. No mercy whatsoever. Uh, for Chelsea, so a great start to the season for them, and um, yeah, brilliant. So that was the that was the good bit of Arsenal news, I suppose, over the weekend. And um, yeah, and of course the, a big signing as well for them with Toby oh, as well. Yeah, wow, wow, what a team they put together. Uh, I might touch on this a bit later on because I think we have a question which uh, might um, refer to this um, in in a while. But look, we were asked back in May mm. to give our transfer predictions. As we do. And yeah. I think it's fair to say, James, that, uh, you know, in, in the many years we've been doing this podcast, there are things that we are good at mm. and there are things where, where we're, you know, we're not quite so good. Correct. Yeah, yeah. And the transfer... I mean, if I had predicted that you would lose the transfer predictions, then almost every year I would have been right. <laughs> it's true. But what I did was I went back to the episode in question and I sort of listened to it again. Incredible I didn't listen commitment. to it. Yep. Didn't listen to the whole thing because I was trying to like flick through to the bit where you said your bid and you did your totals and I did my totals. But it's in Arscast Extra 418, I believe, and it starts about an hour and 24 minutes in. And, uh, well, I think it's fair to say we grossly overestimated the amount of money that we would generate through sales. Yeah, I don't think we're the only ones to be fair. I think Arsenal Football Club grossly overestimated that as well. I think so. But um, we weren't too far away. I mean, we were more ballpark in terms of the money we spent than the money we brought in. Go on, hit me with it. So you said we would spend £91 million. Cheapskates, I thought we'd be. But but 
generate eighty three million pounds. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For a net spend of eight million pounds, um, and I said we would spend one hundred million pounds, but absolutely ludicrously thought we might bring in ninety eight million pounds because I was selling fucking everyone. I sold Lacazette. <laughs> I sold Saliba. Yeah. I sold. I pretty much sold everyone. I think. Mm. Um, there, it's a funny discussion, though, because there's some quite funny bits about Martin Odegaard bringing him back. Um, you said, quite sagely, well, I, don't, I think this might be one which uh, might have to let it play out a bit and see what happens. There you go. There you go. I said we would sign. You said we wouldn't sign a right back. I said, I think we're going to sign. I think we'll sign someone at right back. I'm not sure who, but no. I reckon Very it'll be good. about £23 million pounds is what I said. I don't know how much uh, the right back cost. Tommy Yasu, was it about £20 million, £21 million Yeah, like 16 plus oh, right, okay. It'll be about 20 in right, the end. Okay. It'll be 20 in the yeah, end. Yeah, 20 in the end. Just add on another couple of million and, and there, thereabouts. Yeah. Um, what was the other one? Yeah, Eddie and Keddie was going out for £17 million. Of course. I said, yeah. I said I would buy you a prize if we sold Eddie and Keddie for £17 million. So I'm very sorry to tell you that uh, Damn. there's no prize for you on that. But uh, yeah, there you go. Those were our predictions. That is how wrong we were. And please let that inform the rest of how you think about everything else that we say <laughs> on this show. <laughs> yeah, it is interesting, isn't it? Because, like, you know, clearly the outgoings is kind of the, the major disappointment, I think, for people in this transfer window. But... It, uh, I sort of don't know how fair it is to criticise it, simply because um, we all thought much more would be possible than was possible. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense, but it's kind of like, you know, we made assumptions that maybe were not fair mm. assumptions about who might be able to move for certain amounts of money. And think, I'm not just talking about Eddie and Ketty. I, I know what you mean. I think if every other club had spent the way we spent, we would have sold more. Yeah. <laughs> But but pretty much nobody else did. We were about the only ones who spent really big. Uh, I know mm. Chelsea dished out on Lukaku and um, Man City bought Grealish. You know, big individual transfers. Big but in terms of offers, yeah. in terms of bringing in six players and spending 150 million pounds there or thereabouts, there weren't too many other clubs that did that part of it. So I guess no. you know a big part of the transfer market is is. Uh, the way that money circulates when deals start getting done. So one club sells a player, then they've got some money to invest. Sort of like what uh, Aston Villa did when they knew they were going to sell Grealish to Man City. They basically preemptively spent the Grealish transfer fee on players. Mm. And then when Grealish went, the, their books were pretty much balanced. Maybe they came out with a little bit of a profit. I, I don't quite know. but But beyond that, there wasn't really... Like Inter Milan weren't going to go and spend the Lukaku money. I mean, that went to whoever was financing their debts or whatever it might exactly. be to pay off their their debts. So it, it didn't really happen. Um, I mean, even United paying, what are they paying? Three million pounds a year for five years for Cristiano Ronaldo. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. It's a weird, it, weird market. So Yeah, and I think a lot of clubs who wanted to make sales uh, didn't. You know, Man City had a number of first-team players up for sale. They brought in $24 million in the end. Man United, $25. Um, Liverpool did a bit better, 38 The The big outlier are Chelsea, who somehow managed to bring in £135 million this summer in transfer fees. They are kind of the master exponents of this, I think. How in terms the of, fuck did they do I that? I mean, let's try and break that down. I'm just reading that off a chart that we had on The Athletic. But um, let's see, transfer history, Chelsea. I mean, obviously, they are sort of, as I say, great exponents of sending players out on loan and then cashing in on them. So this summer, £36 million for Tammy Abraham, 31 for Kurt Zuma. 26 for Fikayo Tomori. Um, there was 18 million, I think, wasn't there for um, the boy who went to Palace, the centre half. What's his oh, name? yeah, yeah. Thingy. What's his face? Yokomijig. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. John. Yokomijig. John. John Yokomijig. John Yokomijig, yeah. He's uh, doing well at Palace, I believe. <laughs> Mark Wehi, that's his that's name. That's the fella, John, yeah. Um, 
There are others, even someone like Zappa Costa, they got like eight, 10 million quid for him. That's it. That's but, insane. How are they getting like 10 million for Zappa Costa and we can't get Tuppence Hapenny for Hector Bellerin? How is that possible? So, I, you know, I know what you're saying. Yeah. I do know what you're saying about, uh, you know, about the sales and, and all that kind of stuff. But mm. but some of those Chelsea deals, they, they make a lie of the difficult market situation or, or certainly... You know, it is a difficult market. We understand. We all know it was a difficult market. But it still shows that if you've got really good sellers, good salesmen, mm-hmm. maybe that's what we need. We've joked about this before, that we need a head of sales. I think we do. See, I think, yeah, I think it's much more about what Chelsea have done to, to make those players valuable. So say someone like Tammy Abraham, mm. um, if you look at, the loan spells that he had early in his career with, I think, Bristol, Aston Villa, um, they were incredibly productive and sort of provided a kind of track record that gives him, I think, a certain prestige and value on the transfer market. Mm. You know, Eddie Nketiah has had, what, six months at Leeds in which he didn't start. And that's sort of basically it in terms of like regular first team football. I think the skill of Chelsea is that they station these players, you know, at clubs where they accumulate experience, accumulate value, and then Mm. they feel like less of a risk for a buying club. Like Kurt Zuma is a great example. So he's, he's actually 26 now. He went for 30 million quid. But since he joined Chelsea, he's had a loan back at St Etienne, um, that old trick that you know mm. we've seen used many times. Stoke City spent a season on loan. Everton spent a season on loan, and then played plenty of games for Chelsea too. You know, I, I do think that that's just created a kind of value in these players that we've failed to do. And we look at the guys and we go, "Well, everyone knows Reese Nelson and, and Ketty are talented, so turn up with fifteen million quid, please, or whatever it might be." But until they've proven it at senior level, clubs are going to be wary of taking that gamble. So why don't we fucking just loan them out then? I don't know. Yeah. But I think that's the error. I th- do you know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. I think I think that's where we get it wrong. I think that we don't do the most to make players valuable while mm. they're on our books. Um, yeah, and not just young players either, in fairness. You know, there's some... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, that idea of kind of tanking a player's value. I think that that's... I don't know how much this is down to sort of the negotiations because ultimately buying clubs have a kind of budget and they have the value of a player that they... I mean, I think you could make the case should Arsenal have accepted offers that were on the table uh, for people like Nketiah. You know, we know Palace went to 12 million. I've seen some stuff about maybe personal terms. Yeah, there. so I, I maybe know, we did personally. accept the offer, so... Yeah, who knows? I'm not sure. So, Well, I'm sure some people know. I don't actually know on that one. But if... Um, but there are other cases like Shaka, for example, where the money wasn't what we thought was right or what Edu and Arteta thought was right and mm. so the deal doesn't happen. So you, you can have the debate of like, should we have taken what was on the table? But I also think, yeah, I think we just need to do more to make sure that these players kind of grow in equity in the time that we have them. Because it just feels like in within the club or within the fans, we're like, oh yeah, that guy's talented. But then by the time the market comes around, he's done nothing for six months and no one outside the club is going to put that kind of value on him. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think um, that's fair. And, and Chelsea, like I say, they're very skillful at doing that. And they do have a huge, huge first team squad and they have trimmed it substantially mm. this summer. But yeah, if you look, if you look through the Premier League, they are... This summer, they were the ones. I mean, they, they ended the summer, I think, plus 37 million on the chance of window. And I mean, Zuma, for Zuma is the guy who got absolutely turned inside out by Aubameyang in the, in the cup final. Mm. Wasn't it? Yeah, yeah like because we- there, was that, there was that great clip because it was, uh, there were no fans in the stadium that day. They had one of those like uh, behind the goal cameras. I can't remember which Chelsea player it was, but as Aubameyang went past him, you just hear him go, Oh, Zoo. <laughs> like that, like, oh, no. Oh, Zoo. I can't remember which one, but it's a very, very, very funny moment, obviously, because Aubameyang then went and scored uh, the goals. So, I mean, even with that, he's gone for 30-odd million to West Ham. So, Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, Arsenal brought in, what, the 22 million for Joe Willock this summer. 
10 million um, down the line for a Genduzi. Yeah, in fairness, I do keep forgetting the Genduzi and Mavropanos ones. You I think know, that uh, Mavropanos is only a couple of million as well. Four million or something, something like that, it, yeah. yeah. Um, so what does that take us up to? About 35. So roughly equivalent to what Liverpool brought in, but mm. nothing like what we hoped for and uh, it's interesting the cases where it feels like the club's taken a bit of a gamble that they might be able to get something better down the line I mean look at Reese Nelson gone out on loan but with a one year extension on his contract Shaka maybe Shaka another I mean again yeah they're hoping that maybe they're hoping they will do you think do you think they're hoping that with regard to Shaka or do you think that they <sighs> made so a commitment sure. to the to like just keeping Shaka like it's not the extension wasn't done with the express purpose of, in inverted commas, protecting his value. It was done mm. because they just wanted him to stay, which is, you know, uh, an increasingly depressing thought uh, to me. But there you go. I think if there was a, an appropriate offer on the table next summer, I think they consider it. I think what's certain is that they will have to address that area, mm. you know, next summer. And it's quite interesting, isn't it, after this very busy window i mean I, th- I there was a number flying around from arsenal about something like 19 first team deals involving new con like if you include new contracts transfers in transfers out loans out um it's quite clear sort of where arsenal will be looking in the forthcoming transfer windows you know i think c- uh, central midfield is going to be one center forward i think almost certainly is going to be one um and potentially some sort of goalkeeper I think. Mm. Well, um, look, you, you've sort of brought it around more or less to the to the Edu interview over the weekend. The Edu media blitz, yes. Uh, yes, the Edu extravaganza. Yeah. It's all well, Edu, Edu all show. the time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, look, uh, yeah, look, what, what did you make of the interview? Were you surprised in any way that there was an interview with Edu uh, who is a technical director? I know uh, on the Arscast on Friday, David Ornstein referenced a couple of technical directors across Europe who are a bit more um, front and centre when it comes to the media. They might hold their own press conferences. And, you know, I think it's a cultural thing, maybe, that these uh, these roles at other clubs in other countries are a bit more public facing than they might be in England. I mean, I think I know it's not a brand, brand new thing, but but certainly the technical director side of things is still relatively new in England Um, Mm. you know the culture in England has always been the manager is the man he is the guy who's answerable to everything but of course the organisations have changed and the way they're set up etc has changed over the years so were you surprised that we heard from Edu? Uh, I was a little bit pleasantly surprised to be honest Um, because I know that Arsenal had considered kind of communicating their strategy earlier in the summer and ultimately decided to just let what they were um, doing, do let their actions do the talking. And I think their actions did do the talking, really. I mean, I don't think it took a genius to kind of figure out what the strategy was this summer. Um, and I, it was widely reported, Like, and David spoke about it at length on your show. Um, I, I was a little bit pleasantly surprised. I think Edu has done it. In the past, off the back of windows, I seem to recall maybe this time a year ago, um, you know, after all the uncertainty that had gone on with Raul Sanyei and then the late St. Thomas party, I think he did an interview around that time too. So maybe it's something we'll see from him, you know, that he'll address these things after the window is done. I wonder as well, like, if there is some sensitivity within the club about how much criticism Edu was receiving, which was pretty substantial I'm sure you'll agree online and among the fan base he was coming under really? fire I didn't, hadn't noticed <laughs> hadn't noticed anything about a barbecue or anything no. or being on a boat or, okay really? fair enough oh, um, you can tell me tell me offline after <laughs> I, yeah so I think they were keen to kind of make it clear that while he was uh, while he was at the grill he was still on the grid shall we say wow. throughout the summer yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I think um I think it's good. I do think that this kind of communication is important. I think that um, I don't think it told fans or certainly quite engaged fans anything they didn't especially know. I think we could all kind of figure this out for ourselves. But having someone being prepared to be the front man of that and kind of wear it publicly, Mm -hmm. I think is I think is good. Do you? Yeah, I was happy to see it. I I think more communication. 
I think the better a club can communicate its ideas, particularly when things are going wrong, uh, the better. Mm. You know, I think it's it's a, it's a good skill to have. It's a good thing to be able to communicate directly with fans. I know this was done with Sky Sports, but I think even that was probably, you know, quite... They could have done it through the official website. You know what I mean? Yeah, could and they easily did do some down. stuff, I think, didn't they? Yeah, the I think so. Well. But, like, you know, when, when it is a, an outside organisation... Um, you know, you can't necessarily be accused. Like he could have given the same answers to an interviewer from Arsenal.com, same questions, et cetera, et cetera. And just by virtue of the fact that it would be on the official website, people could dismiss it as propaganda or, you know, this is Pravda, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, they had to do it with, with an external outlet. I think I would have liked him to be pressed a little bit more on on certain aspects of it because I think you're right. The, the stuff about the incoming strategy is pretty clear. You know, we could all it's see... It's kind of self-explanatory, Yeah, it's it? self-explanatory. Um, you know, we know that you've been um, targeting younger players. We know that we've got, a, you know, some some existing good young players at the club around which to build. But I think I would have liked maybe just a little more on, on you know, the outgoing business not being as good as we would have liked. I think... You know, you could have he could have been drilled a little bit harder than that, and I think also mm. some of the stuff that that I think it's difficult for Edu to at this point anyway distance himself from some of the issues that we have when it comes to selling players because he was at the club, he was technical director. Um, you know, when certain players were brought in, transfer deals didn't work. You know, he yeah. It's like uh, he's sort of pivoted to this one without, I'm not saying he's abdicated himself of responsibility, but I do think, you know, some questions around that might have been uh, more challenging for him to answer and I think maybe could have provided a little more insight. But, um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think, um, I think that personally, I felt like there was a little bit of sort of retconning going on especially when he spoke about you know we started implementing this strategy last summer because i have to be honest when i look at last summer's business it's so different well it's to, to what yeah, we- exactly it's a thomas party was 27 willian yeah. was 56 and gabrielle of course was a young player who's 22 or whatever um yeah. so that was it in terms of our incoming uh, we brought in alex runison but let's never speak of that again um mm. you know so yeah it doesn't really add up unless they sort of went oh bollocks a year ago I think it's probably just something that you say to make it sound like that's what you were doing a year ago when uh, everyone can see it wasn't yeah I think I think they were sort of uh, coming round to this way of thinking by the time January rolled around and they you know paid a lot of players off and brought Martin Odegaard in on loan but last summer and in fairness, it was a very chaotic, destabilised summer for lots of different reasons. I don't think they were already kind of on this path. Yeah. Um, so, so you know, I, I understand the temptation to kind of wreck on that, but sure. I do think that this does feel like a more recent change of direction. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, how do you feel about it when it's laid out for you in the way that Edu did? Do you... Are you on board with well, it as I a think strategy? We said this last week on the show that like, we were talking about the strategy and we were talking yeah. about the incoming business. And while it's still too early to say if these transfers are going to be good or successful, I think we both said, despite you know the, the kind of high dudgeon we found ourselves in uh, on last week's show because of the Man City defeat and you know things were yeah. still a bit raw at that point, what we both made clear was that like, in terms of a strategy, we liked it. We were on board with that. We uh, can see that that's a way of operating which is different from what we've done in the past. We can't keep repeating the same mistakes. So maybe these will be just different mistakes, but ideally it will be a success. And I think what what I like is there's a, it's coherent. You know, mm. it's coherent. It's not necessarily manager specific. It can grow and develop under the next manager or the next manager. You know what I mean? So these young players... Growing this group of young players together, I like it. I'm on board. You know, it's one of those things, I think, uh, as a football fan, 
this idea of a young group of players coming together to become, you know, all conquering heroes is is quite a romantic one. I get as well that it's quite a far fetched one, but mm-hmm. as a thing to sort of believe in, it's there. Where I had a little bit of doubt was when he talked about the experienced players that we need to to help these young players realize their potential. And he name checked five of them, and I don't. I it wasn't convincing to me because there are issues with those players. So mm-hmm. Alex Lacazette. So who are the five? Well, he mentioned Lacazette, Shaka, Aubameyang, Partey, and Burned Leno. So Burned mm-hmm. Leno has just seen the club spend twenty four million pounds on a goalkeeper who you know he knows, we know, they know, everyone knows, is, is going to replace him because that's the only reason you spend twenty four million pounds on a goalkeeper. Mm -hmm. Lacazette's in the last year of his contract. I'm not saying that he can't and won't be a good role model to the young players and, you know, on the training ground, et cetera, et cetera, but he's not here for the long haul. He's probably going to go next summer, as is Leno. Xhaka, uh, he's just too much Xhaka. He's exasperating. Mm -hmm. Um, I just, you know, the last few weeks have really... Yeah, look, I I just... (sighs) I know we could have a big, big discussion about leadership and what have you, but, you know, uh, he if he is the kind of leader that you're looking for in the dressing room, I, I have some worries. That's all. Mm-hmm. Just I have some worries about that. Mm-hmm. And Aubameyang... And also, let's let's say in that discussion as well, there was the potential that he was going to leave the club this summer. Yeah. It, it's not beyond the realms of possibility he will leave the club in, in the yep. nearish future too. Yeah, it is not exactly a kind of unshakable pillar at the heart of the club. Correct. Um, who else? Obama Yang. Look, I think a uh, really popular guy in the dressing room. Uh, I don't think he's necessarily a natural captain, but I do think he understands the you know the the role and the profile and all that kind of stuff. But you know, at the same time, he's thirty two. Or, you know, so he's he's towards the end of his career. Thomas Partey, 28, the right age, you know, for a player in this kind of setup to, to be one of the, you know, the foundations, the cornerstones of it. Absolutely. But and I think he can do it. I think he really can do it, but he's got to stay fit. And, mm. you know, that's not a criticism of him because I don't think he can do anything about the kind of tackle that put him out for the few weeks that he's been out in that game against Chelsea. That's not that's not being injury prone. That's not being weak or not looking after yourself or not being fit for whatever reason. You know, it's just an unfortunate thing. But nevertheless, injury issues have have been um, have been a thing. So when you're when you're the good part of your plan is f- I'm not going to say fully dependent, but by Edu's own admission, it is quite dependent on the guidance that these guys can bring to these young players. Mm. That's where I find it 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 sort of falls down a little for me. Yeah, I know what you mean. And I wonder, I mean, obviously, you know, they know the situation surrounding those players. Um I, I'd wonder, is this just sort of a way of f- slightly throwing the gauntlet down to them mm. and also de- kind of describing the strategy in a way that still makes these big, influential players in the dressing room, at least, feel part of things? I mean, if you come out there and say, listen, we're about the youth, we're, we want to have a young squad, blah, blah, blah. You know, do you end up making mm. someone like Leno, who's already seen what's happened with Aaron Ramsdale coming in and probably knows what that means for the future, end up feeling very disconnected very quickly? Um, is this a way of kind of trying to anchor these guys um, or tie them rather sort of to the project and make them feel part of it? I, I wonder if that might be what they're thinking. Yeah, maybe. Because the question marks are so obvious. You know, and we we all see them. Um, And I think separate to that, I do have another concern, which is obviously like it's great to have a young squad. And, you know, there have been squads full of young players in the Premier League that have gone on and done great things. But it has always been dependent on, you know, several guiding lights, senior players who, you know, were the right kinds of leaders for those young Mm. players. And I think it's fair to say that right now it's difficult to have confidence that we have those um, and so that 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 let, puts an awful lot of onus and responsibility 
on a very young group. Yeah, I think the other thing to mention as well is that there's a sort of mid-level group of players as well. <laughs> yeah, where, where they, how do they feel? Because yeah. they, they don't even get a mention. We're not young. We're not uh, like yeah. elder statesmen, but we're still pretty experienced. So you think of... Where was Cedric Suarez in the five pillars? Uh, exactly, Rob. It's almost as if that brace in a behind-closed doors <laughs> friendly <laughs> against Brentford didn't, didn't even match. happen. Jesus. But I mean, <laughs> Cedric, Pablo Marie... Rob yeah. Holding, Callum Chambers. Kal- yeah, I mean, he's still here El and Nenny. likely to be here. El Nenny, exactly. So I think those are those are another aspect of it where, look, every squad has got its workman-like players. Yeah. You just can't, unless you're one of the super, super rich clubs, and even then they carry some, some sort of, uh, not dead weight, but, you know, there, there's a... There are players who are just not not as good, but we we have a bit more um, than most clubs right now. So I do wonder, I do wonder what they're thinking. The in betweeners, the in betweeners, who they are football yeah. friends. <laughs> yeah, it is odd. I mean, they're conspicuous by the absence. I can see why Edu wouldn't cite mm. Cedric or Pablo Marie. You know, in a public space right now, they're not exactly um, fan favourites from from where I'm stood, but. Mm. Yeah, it, they are kind of sort of in no man's land, really, between these two two groups. Um, and, and listen, I mean, if, if there's one thing we know, it's that not all these kids are going to make it, are going to yeah. be the great players they hope. We've been here before, haven't we? We've seen really promising groups of players and maybe it's a few that actually deliver against that potential. I don't think we can anticipate that, you know, Sambi definitely becomes Arsenal central midfielder mm. and Tommy Asu is a revelation at right back and, oh, and Ramsdale's number one. I just think the chances of them all coming off are slim. So I think there is going to be pressure and responsibility on the other other parts of the squad, the older age groups, and they, they do need to deliver. Um, it was interesting as well hearing Edu kind of talk about or not talk about timelines, really. You know, he kind of was pushed on what's the aim for this season. He really didn't want to attach to something specific to that for obvious reasons. You know, if they, yeah. if they set something out publicly, they, they will fall short. But you did get the sense of um, this being a more mid-term than short-term project certainly you know yeah i agree and and that's a difficult question like you know um about what yeah. what where we're going to finish or, like yeah what you know season. but uh, i did quite enjoy um the messaging that came from the new arsenal women coach yesterday mm. uh jonas Eideval, when he talked about we are a big club and he you know he made that assertion um, you know, knowing that he's got some tough teams to beat in the league this season if he wants Arsenal to be champions. Um, and I just wonder if maybe there was an opportunity missed there to just sort of try and galvanise people a little. You know, mm. I know you can't say, well, we're definitely going to finish sixth this year. We're definitely going to finish fifth this year. And, you know, uh, you can't get excited about that. Like if he said, we're going to finish fifth this year and we didn't, he's going to get hammered. And if he Mm. does say it, people are going to go, well, so what? Mm. I mean, yeah, it's progress, but you know, you can't be um, crowing about finishing fifth. So it is a difficult one, but I just, I just wonder if there was an opportunity missed just to try and bring everybody around. I think that's what he tried to do. And obviously, you know, speaking out the way that he spoke out and um, and everything else, I think it was an attempt to try and placate some of the some of the shitstorm that's been going on because because of the start to the season. Um, yeah, and I think he could only do this interview really in a gap without games, to be honest. I think it almost required things to mm. settle slightly for him to come out and speak in this way. And I do wonder if maybe not, you know, if he had said we're a big club and we're sat in 20th place, like, does it open him as much, open him up to derision as much as anything else? Mm. I don't know. But yeah, I, I, uh, I, well, it's always good, I think, to hear from people who are, you know, ultimately the decision makers at the club and get some sense of 
where we're going. It, it, it just, you know, a phrase we use on this podcast quite habitually is the proof will be in the pudding. Mm. And that kind of never feels truer, really, than with the recruitment that the club has done this summer. Um, because they're all sort of bets, aren't they? They're yeah. all bets on potential. Um rather than a Thomas Partey and a Bamiang kind of a proven, you know, uh, oven ready talent. Um so yeah, we we we'll have to kind of wait and see. And I'm fascinated to see how many of those signings squeeze yeah. into the team for the weekend. Yeah, I mean that's what we said last week, isn't it? When you know, yeah. when the team runs out against Norwich, I know there's an enforced absence in in Xhaka because he can't play. So um, that that obviously, hopefully, um, will mean a place for for Sambi if Thomas Partey is fit again. But like, how much? I'm not saying it's easier for people to get behind the team, but how much more exciting would it be if you've got? a new guy in goal if you've got a new centre half you've got the other relatively new centre half back in alongside him you've got a new right back you've got Tierney you've got Sambi you've got Martin Odegaard in the team you know you've got your exciting guys in Saka, Smith, Rowe Pepe, Aubameyang etc etc I I feel like that is a team that people would definitely um, feel good about getting behind Uh, and hopefully Mm. a team that can produce the kind of performance that we need against Norwich so and and Edu did say, I think you know, I want to see the team, and we've not seen it yet. Well, that's yeah, correct. So, well. yeah, it'd be very interesting to see. I think certainly, certainly in the defence, you know, a lot of those new names are going to be involved. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm really hoping that Norwich provides uh, a bit of kind of catharsis yeah. and relief. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, some goals and. Shit, that would be good. Um, okay, well, look, I think we have some sort of associated questions with the okay. uh, with the Edu interview. So we'll uh, take a little break here, as we always do, and we will come back with your questions and more in part two right after this. Welcome back to the Arsecast Extra. This is part two of the show where we answer the questions that you sent to us on Twitter at Gunnerblog and at Arsblog and also on the Arsblog Discord chat server, which you get access to if you are an Arsblog member on Patreon. We've got some stuff coming on Patreon this week as well. On Wednesday, I think we're going to do an episode of Waffle in which uh, James and I talk about anything and everything apart from Arsenal and football. We take your questions and suggestions uh, on Patreon, on the Discord as well. So feel free to join us for that. Patreon.com forward slash Arse blog. James is absolutely roasting in my office. Um, is it? Roasting. Because the sun is shining um, right through the through the window here, so I'm having to let the blind so down. I'm a, not... Like a magnifying glass. Yeah, um, a little bit. Yeah. Like I'm some kind of podcasting ant to the <laughs> mean god of the sun. Um, absolutely. But I'm not complaining. I love hot weather, so uh, there you go. Uh what was I going to say? There was something else. Never mind. I'll come back to it. I'll remember it uh, or I won't. Okay. So if I don't, nobody will know the difference. Here's a question from mm. Andre Benjamin, who's at Dope Gooner. Apparently he's uh, really good. Uh, he says, how do you think Arteta feels about uh, Edu's Sky Sports interview? A lot of what our technical director said to Jeff Shreve seemed to indicate that it's now in the hands of the manager. Did Edu throw Arteta under the bus or was he just stating facts? I think there's a bit of sort of um, positioning going on, certainly uh, on Edu's part. And I think as well, on the part of the club. I mean, since Arteta got that promotion to being manager, there has been a sort of vagueness about the hierarchy and the process and the structure, certainly on the outside of the club, you know, who who's doing what, who's in charge, who's running this show. And I think part of the public interview was a, a sort of edu, you know, kind of uh, not throwing his weight around, but sort of, you know, trying to demonstrate what he brings to the party. And I think... Yeah, look, if your technical director's out there saying, I'm looking forward to seeing this team come together, we've really supported the manager, all those kinds of, you know, ding, ding, ding mm. uh, phrases, then it does throw a certain spotlight on Arteta. Um, but I wouldn't call that throwing him under the bus. I would just call that the reality of the situation. I mean, the manager, mm. the head coach, whatever you want to call him, sooner or later has to 
get results. Um, and, uh, you know, whatever, anything Edu says doesn't massively change that. I didn't get the sense from Edu that, you know, they're trying to distance him from Arteta or create a sense. You know, it wasn't the kind of dreaded vote of confidence uh, kind of thing. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, the pressure is real because they need some wins. What do you think? I think you're spot on there, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, David sort of described Edu and Arteta as a two-headed beast mm. <laughs> the other day, and I do. I, I think that's true. I, I, I don't know, you know, what you say about their being positioning, I, I think is right, but I don't know that there's quite the still the distance or whatever that there there would be at other clubs between the technical director and the manager. Um, mm. But yeah, look, the reality is, and we've said this, Arteta has been backed in the transfer market mm. more than any other manager in the Premier League. In fact, probably more than any other manager in Europe this summer in terms of what was spent. Mm. So with that comes pressure. And the reality is for a club like Arsenal, you've got to, you've got to start producing. You've got to start delivering in terms of results and performances. So there's only so much the club can do during a transfer window to give a manager what he wants. And after that, he's kind of flying solo, if you know what I mean. Um, so Yeah, and, and I think you have to um, give the club some credit for uh, proceeding with the incoming plans despite the failure to do uh, the outgoing business that was hoped for. You know, they've still, we thought they'd bring in, and maybe they thought they'd bring in £100 million in sales to pay mm, for this yeah, rebuild. Yeah. They haven't done it, but they have at least still supported the manager and, and got him half a dozen new players. And, you know, I, I mean, in a lot of cases, it's Mikel Arteta's final say-so on who those players are. So, mm. you know, inevitably it places a bit of uh, a spotlight on him. Yeah, I mean, that's why I do think as well that the as much as there's pressure on Arteta, there is pressure on Edu too. Um, for all the justifications and the rationalizations and, and, and the seeking to understand that we have done uh, with regards to the, the outgoing business, I reckon there was an expectation that we were going to bring in more than we did. And when you're you're in the position where that is your remit, then I think that comes with some pressure too. So, mm. um, yeah, they, they I, both I, have I, to do it, you know? They do, yeah, yeah. And I think, was it on the Arscast that David said, you know, in theory, if Arteta was to go... Eddie would be the man to lead the search for his replacement. Was that on the Ask Cast? Could have been, I can't else? remember. Either way, you know, that's right, that's correct within the hierarchy of the club. But like you, I feel that um, because there's such overlap between these roles, I don't know how clean that would ultimately be. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if, yeah. if one fell, the other might fall with them. Um, that if you're a two-headed beast and one of the heads gets chopped off, mm. it's probably quite unlikely the beast survives. Um, yeah, I mean, and I wonder if <laughs> it's hard without it one of your heads. Without one of your heads, you know? yeah, yeah. There's a lot of bleeding in that scenario. <laughs> a lot of um, gushing, a lot of gushing going on there, you know. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, we're not at that point yet, mm. but I think um, the pressure is on Arteta, and you know, a home game against Norwich few games into the season is not characteristically one that you would associate with being a high pressure occasion mm. but I think in this instance uh, it absolutely is yeah. shall we have another question let's okay there's lots of questions what about this from Ish Mohammed, who's at imo1990 on Twitter and Ish says quite happy with our right back signing but isn't there something uncomfortable about one of the pros of the signing being the fact that he can cover the supposed oh pardon me I just did a burp, uh, <laughs> cover the supposed <laughs> defending deficiencies of the fifty million pound centre back we just bought? Um, but I mean, is that a real thing? Is that a real thing, or is that just something that someone on Twitter said? Yeah. 
Like, is that? I don't think. I don't think the club are thinking of it in that way. No, I don't think they're thinking. Yeah. Well, we better <laughs> buy. <laughs> we better buy a good right back because the it, Ben White's absolutely shit. Yeah, yeah. Mikel Arteta said, "I'm very happy to sign this right back. He gives us something that uh, you know we clearly lack, and that our new 50 million pound signing just can't do. So you know, it's great that mm. we've got him in. I, you know, I, I, I think what's happened is Ben White had a difficult game in the air against Brentford. Um, it wasn't as bad as it was made out. I think he won right. three of seven. And my 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 recollection of watching it was that it was worse than it was. But when I went back to look at it again uh, and look at the challenges and look at the, the stats, you know, he was out jumped a few times and it didn't look good, but he did win some headers as well. Um I'm trying to remember wh- where I'm going with this. I've completely lost my train of thought. I mean, the, the um, Tommy Yasu is really good in the air. His his aerial stats are kind of off the charts. So I just wonder if people have looked at that, looked at what happened to Ben White in his first game as an Arsenal player, and put two and two together, and you know, come up with five a little bit. Mm. That's mm. I think. Think. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. We, you know, we spent a lot of money on Ben White, and like you say, we haven't seen a lot of him so far. Mm. And what we've seen um, wasn't especially convincing against Brentford. I, if I look at the signings and I sort of try and evaluate them all individually, and I think about uh, you know how they fit into the team, how they fit into the project, what Edu said about Ben White was was interesting, wasn't it? He said something like, um, you know. Between us, Mikel and I decided that uh, we we needed to really put a lot of emphasis on the centre back position because we were losing David Louise and we needed someone to replace them. Um, I, I, I the, my only sort of worry with Ben White as a signing is just when I look at that defence. You know, we know it's almost certainly going to be Tierney, Gabriel, because Pablo Marie looks nowhere near it at the moment. Ben White, mm. Tommy Yasu. It is a defence that is very uh, young. You know, there's experience in all those players. A lot of them have played an awful lot of senior football already. But, you know, is are any of them the guy to kind of marshal that back line? And that's my only kind of worry um, when I look at those names and look at how they've pieced together. Yeah. You know, when you talk about having the five players or whatever, the senior pros who you want to build around, I kind of wouldn't mind one of them being a centre half. Yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. But look, we've we've said um before that when there's a gap, when people who are in leadership roles and whether you liked him or you didn't like him David Luiz was certainly that he was certainly that kind of character you know on the pitch and in the training ground whether you think his um, constant red cards and penalties is is a great example to be setting anyway is a, is a different question but I, I, I think just in general in terms of personality but we're looking for people to step up we're looking for characters to emerge and for those people to to take responsibility. So whether it is Ben White or whether it's Kieran Tierney becomes a bit more vocal back there, well, that'd be hard considering he's never really there. You know, Gabriel doesn't necessarily come across as that guy, but, you know, maybe after a year in England, settled into the club, a bit more comfortable with the language, mm. et cetera, et cetera, maybe he could be, you know, that kind of a character. Um, Tommy Asu, I'm, I'm quite curious because we, we didn't talk about this because transfer window closed on Tuesday, obviously. And um, we did the podcast on Monday. I'm curious, you know, what your, your sort of broad thoughts on him as a player. Mikel Arteta talked about how he's a versatile defender. Um, I've had some messages from people who say he's a centre half, really, much more than a right back, uh, even mm-hmm. though he has has played there. I mean, do you think that versatility is a good thing? Do you think we could have done with a more specialised? specialist right back perhaps uh, or you know do you think there's something going on in terms of this uh profile of player coming in that might speak to the way that we're going to set up the team um this season yeah it's interesting one i mean he's played a lot of different roles he's played you know right side of three center backs he's played uh left center back in a 4-4-2 mm. He's played left back briefly. He has played right back a lot. I don't think it's the case that we've got 
you know, Johan Juru filling in at right back a couple of games. He, the season before last, yeah. he was Bologna's right back consistently. Last season, he played um, a bit more at centre half. I think that that is generally quite a valuable trait to have. I think, especially if there might be times of the season when the system shifts. I also think. You know, Pablo Marie's looks so bad at left-sided centre-half that bringing in a defender who can potentially do that job if required isn't the worst thing in the mm. world. Um, you know, maybe, you know, maybe in the future we do add another right-back and Tommy Asu ends up being counted one, more as one of our four centre-halves. I wouldn't preclude that possibility. But what we know about Arteta and the way his team plays, the shape and the system they play with, I think he is a, a sort of a decent fit for a right back in Arteta's system. Um, and I've heard some people say, well, what if we change manager? Well, then Tommy Asu probably, if they want to go with a more overlapping attacking right back, then you count him as one of his centre halves. And he's still a, a really good, promising young defender. I don't think that's a disaster. But I think he will play right back for Arteta. Um, and I think that might start as, as soon as Saturday. I hope it does. Um, and, I, and I'm really intrigued to see how he gets on. I mean, he's had a really interesting journey, you know, coming out of Japanese football via Belgium into Serie A, which is sort of, you know, the, a pretty good schooling for for any young defender. And now to England, um, it sounds like he's got, you know, great attitude, tremendous work ethic, plenty of ability off two feet. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing him. Yeah. What, 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 what are your sort of general thoughts about the signing? surprising because you know I, I hadn't really heard a great deal about him um mm -hmm. i like the fact that he gives us a bit of presence in that yeah. area of the pitch six foot two six yeah. foot two so you know while i do think the ben white thing is a bit overblown um i do think he is somebody who who can add something in that area of the pitch we're not the biggest team in the world uh either so having somebody with a bit of presence from set pieces etc is good he looks a very tidy footballer good with both feet and i think that's one of the interesting things uh you know that i've noticed about uh, him and ben white both of them can switch the play quite well with with their wrong foot with their left foot so uh I think that's an interesting aspect to him. Looks good on the ball. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing him play. He's he's new. He gives us something different on that right hand side. You know, he's not Cedric. He's not um, Callum Chambers. Uh, although I think he's maybe closer in profile to a Callum Chambers than a Cedric, if you like that that kind of traditional Definitely, right back. Yeah. Um, I also think just on that, by the way, you know, I know a lot of um, supporters, certainly from sort of my social media interactions, were kind of hoping we might get a kind of right-sided Kieran Tierney. And I think there's, um, you know, a bit of concern that Tommy Astley might not bring that. One thing I wanted to just point out is that I think there's a very good case that the best right-back that we've seen at Arsenal this side of the millennium was Bakary Sanya. Yeah. And Bakary Sanya was by no means a great attacking player, but he was a fantastic defender. And I do wonder if, you know, sometimes we, I mean, I know the trend has changed regarding fullbacks and the, the, the nature of the position has changed, but there's something to be said for having a guy who is a defender first um, yeah. And it, it looks like that's what we have in Tommy Asu. Who knows if he'll be as good as Sanya? But Sanya was obviously outstanding, wasn't he? Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Um, this is a team that could use good defenders and good defending and good defensive habits as well. Mm. And, you know, the other thing as well is that uh, uh, I think it was Phil Costa was saying, you know, at Bologna, he was playing a very specific role there. Like, you know, they're not a, an open, expansive attacking team. No. Um, I mean, in fairness, neither are we right now <laughs> it's but, it's match made in heaven yeah. but we're hoping you know that that's something that we can become so you know if he is given a bit more freedom of expression um it's uh, you know maybe it's a case that he can do more in the final third than he has done at bologna you know because people will look mm. at well what are his final third stats um but when you're playing in a team that demands you play in a specific way or you you know I mean, famously, wasn't it? Mourinho didn't want his fullbacks going over the halfway line at times, such was the mm. way he instructed them to play within his system. So, you know, you could look at you could look at those aspects of it as well. So, look, I, I think he's uh, an exciting, interesting signing, like pretty much all the ones that we've made this summer. 
because mm. of their youth, because of what we can project onto them. Um, and I hope yeah, it does and we really don't well. hate them because they didn't used to play for Chelsea. Yeah, they've <laughs> never helps. done. They've never done anything to hurt, to hurt us or disappoint uh, us. Yeah, they arrive without stigma in, yeah. in most cases. Um, anyway, your question. My question. Okay, here's one from D Smith on the Discord. He said, "This is going to be a weird question, but in business, when a project is in process, there there are leading indicators that you can assess during the process to figure out if things are working without having to wait until the final results." Uh, as mm -hmm. Arsenal are apparently embarking on a project of youth and squad building, what are the indicators beyond results that you'll be looking for over the next few months? Oh, that's a very good question. I mean, obviously, within football, results do kind of provide a lot of those indicators. Yeah. Um, but what are the indicators beyond results? Uh, I think one thing that a lot of people would say is kind of cohesion and style. That, you know, some sense of a team identity being born. And I actually mean that in a tactical sense, but I, I think I also mean it in a kind of very... Um, soft factory sense too you know i think if we see a group emerging and different leaders within that group i think that will be encouraging in its own way um if we can see kind of an evolution in the squad mm. indicators beyond that i think you're just looking for improvement from those young players i think you're looking to see are these undoubtedly is this undoubtedly talented group getting better under this coach mm. are, are they on the right path are they on a positive trajectory um and even if the results aren't what we might like i think those indicators will give the people behind the project some faith and conviction that it it's worth persisting with is there anything else that i'm not thinking of i just i guess it's it's New what, kits, really nice new kits. Yeah, as we well. don't. They're quite a big one. Don't need any more of those. Uh, if we, you know, if we were as good at playing football as we were adverts, at Adidas adverts, Adidas ads, and fucking kit <laughs> launches, we would be fucking Champions League winners every season. But I think what you're just looking for is for what your eyes can tell you. You know, when you watch a game of football, you know, when you watch a team, when you watch a squad, you can tell if there's yeah. um, if things are going in the right direction. You can tell if players are working hard for each other. Um, you can tell if there's the right kind of commitment. And, you know, on top of what you said about just general improvement, um, without being in any way facetious, scoring goals, getting results. Yeah, no, yeah. no, I mean, I'm, and I'm, I'm not. I mean, no, no. one of the metrics I think that we were looking for before this season started was, you know, I think we, how many goals did we score last season? 55 or 58 in the Premier League? I mean, that's nowhere near enough. Nowhere mm. near enough. So one of the things that we were looking for this uh, this season was, well, are we going to score more goals? Are we going to be more creative? And if you can see those things happening um, and, and the football is better or improved or whatever it might be, um, yeah, those are the things that can tell you where we're going to go. 55 goals we, we um, scored last season. So... Mm. We need to be scoring more than that. Uh, so those things, you know, they're, they're things yeah. that we we can all see. We can all see with our eyes. Uh, well, the eye test, yeah, I think that's I think that's a big one. You know, can we see improvement that we don't have to go, you know, uh, sifting through the most in-depth of numbers to find? You know, can we see things that are tangible signs of uh, progress? You know, exactly. We don't need to make up a new expected something metric yeah. to justify the exactly. way that we're playing. You know what I mean? And yeah. that's not to be dismissive yeah. of stats or anything like it, but you know what no, I mean? No, 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 exactly. We don't need to kind of uh, construct these quite complicated arguments to justify. We can just watch mm. the team and be like, oh, that's actually a bit better. Yeah, that's better. I, <laughs> that would I like be really that. nice. Yeah. That's what I would like. Um, <laughs> yeah, a bit more of that. Yeah. Um, here's a good question Golden Cannon on Twitter. What do you think of the media treatment of Arsenal? Recently, it seems they've taken joy out of our struggles, sometimes excessively so. Do you think there is an agenda there? And if so, why? We aren't dominating the league and we hardly challenge. What's going on? Um, do I think? I mean, I just think we're an easy target right now. 
we're absolutely, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. You know, Arsenal is a big, we're a big club and we're underperforming. Therefore, you're going to get it in the neck. And I think what's interesting, I, I might have said this before, is that I feel like nowadays, and I don't just mean this about Arsenal fans, I think football f- fans or fans of a specific club are super, super informed about what's going on at their clubs. Because... Mm-hmm. There are blogs, there are podcasts, there are YouTube channels. Every aspect of the club is covered from top to bottom. And if you want to read everything, you can do that. You can know everything there is to know about a football club. And I think what happens is, if you're Johnny Pundit, you can't be as granular with your knowledge. Mm -hmm. Like Jamie Carragher might know about Liverpool and Gary Neville might know about Man United and Jamie Redknapp might know about fucking that bunch of cunts that he used to play for. You know what I mean? But your average guy, your average pundit, your average journalist, and again, this is not to be critical, cannot understand a football club to the level that a fan can if the fan is invested in knowing about their football club, right? So they might say something, which is their personal opinion, whatever it might be, but... It might not make any sense because the fan or the fans know something different. Mm -hmm. Like Gary Neville last week saying, I don't really know what Arsenal's transfer strategy is, is a bit... Great example, yeah. A bit stupid because even with um, peripheral knowledge of, of Arsenal this summer, like I'd say most football fans could say, hey, look... They're buying players who are like 21, 22, 23. All the players they've been linked with are like 21, 22, 23. So, yeah, I wonder what their strategy could be. (laughs) Hang on, I'll see if I can work this one. Uh, Oh, I've got it. You know what I mean? So I I think some of of it is just a bit daft. Um, Some of it is, is, I'm going to say ignorance, but that's not, it sounds like a strong word, right? Um, when you say... You just mean that it's not their... Um, that they're not specialised in yeah. Arsenal, whereas we all are. We know... They don't know the context Exactly. As well. That's it. So I don't necessarily think there is a, a bias. I think there are obviously some pundits out there and some, some journalists out there who have leanings, uh, who may or may not like Arsenal, who see this as an opportunity to be a bit snide and put the, the boot in. But... You know, at the end of the day, if we were winning and we were top of the league, A, we wouldn't give a fish's tit what any of them were saying about anything. And Mm. B, we wouldn't be the target. It'd be whoever else is underperforming, whether it was, you know, Chelsea in that season where they finished 12th or whatever it was when Mourinho got sacked. I mean, they must have got a hard time in the media. I didn't pay any attention because I was too busy just not giving a shit about Chelsea. But Mm. I'd say... It's just something that we feel a bit more acutely right now because of what's going on. And it's because what's been going on of late has just not been good enough. So yeah. the, the simple solution is to make things better, is to improve. And then you don't give anyone the opportunity to talk about you in a way that you don't like. The other option, of course, is just, you know, use your off button. Don't click the yeah. link, you know. I- and the other thing I would say is that maybe, you know, as Arsenal fans, we should be worried when people aren't talking about the club in this mm. way. You know, I think the fact is we are, it is a really big club and we are in pretty dire straits in terms of our league position. And whenever that's the case, you're going to have a target on your back. Uh, it's the disparity between sort of where we should be and where we are that creates all that conversation. Mm. Um So at least I think it indicates that people think of Arsenal as a big club still, uh, you know, even though our our results undercut that substantially. Um, I I don't think there's a particular bias. I think like you, we're just an easy target. We're there to be had. Mm. You know, it's interesting. And results influence that. When you're losing games, you get stories around clubs that you just probably wouldn't get or they they generate traction that they wouldn't get if you were winning or if you're top of the league yeah um everything becomes a stick to beat the club with you know it's easy to believe the worst when things are going badly 
you know, yeah. and it's, yeah, it's it's just, and look, I think as well, it is easy for people to have a go because you can say anything right now mm. about Arsenal, any kind of criticism, and it will ring true for somebody at least because of because of everything, you know? So Yeah, exactly. And I think, um, you know, I, I felt that a little bit with the Maitland-Niles one that was going on over deadline day where, I, you know, ultimately Arsenal rejected a loan offer from Everton. And I think if Arsenal were winning games and we trusted Eddie and Arteta and we thought they were competent people, as a fan base, we probably would have been like, well, yeah, hold out for a better loan fee or more money. Mm. But because there isn't that trust and we're in crisis and we're in disarray, you know, it all it all becomes framed as uh, calamity and incompetence. And, mm. you know, I, it's it's just an interesting... The, the, the context is everything, you know, and, and when the club aren't winning, they're going to be slaughtered. And I think we have to accept that, you know, that's the pressure of being a big club. That's the pressure of sport. You yeah. have to deliver. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I hope... The other thing is that as long as there's... It's important that Edu's come out and spoken because as long as there are... Is there is, as long as there is a gap which we can fill with, well, maybe these people are incompetent or other people outside the club who aren't fans or journal, who people who are journalists or yeah. other media, you know, as long as that gap's there, there's always going to be an issue. Whereas at least now the club have said this is what we're doing and you can critique it and you can think it's bad, but you can't think it's just chaos at least. Um, and I think that helps actually, and that will kind of control that narrative a little You know, Gary Neville, he can't say what he said a week ago now. He can say, I don't think it's a good idea, but he can't yeah. say, I don't know what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, even a cursory look at what we were doing would tell you what we were doing. I mean, so. to be honest, yes, I think he should have been able to get there anyway, but I think at least there is that absolute clarity now. By the way, uh, there was another question about media that I thought was very really interesting. Danny Dimovsky said, um, thoughts on Emmy Martinez constantly bringing up <laughs> Arsenal every time he talks to the media. It's almost like a bitter obsession or a grudge. And there were a few questions like this. Yeah. I, I don't know what he's actually said, Emmy. I don't know, what I he's don't said. know either. I mean, I, I, I saw they kept me in a prison, the gilded cage of London Colony. Um, you know, Jerry Payton used to burn my feet with hot coals, and <laughs> I don't know what he said. I know, but what I, yeah, go, <laughs> go on. on. You go. Well, we'd one on the Discord from David the Sky who said, "How concerned are you by the rumours that Emmy Martinez is going to talk uh, about Arsenal on his deathbed?" So I, <laughs> I feel like I've kind of missed out something, but I'm guessing it was, you know, an interview. He does seem to be talking about us a lot for a guy, well, you know, who left a year ago at this point. You know, whatever about having a, you know, an interview when you first leave, to be still talking about it, you know, I don't know. Let me just see what he's actually said. He said that Arsenal did not understand. Uh, it's something about international duty. Oh, I, I've got no idea. But basically, what I was going to say was it may not be Emmy's fault. Because we are a magnet for, uh, because we are such an easy target mm -hmm. and the Martinez story is another stick to beat the club with, you know, um, the fact that he left and we sold him and he's gone on and done so well. You know, it, ultimately it's journalists who are asking him these questions. It's people putting the name mm. of Arsenal in front of him for him to comment on, I suspect. And, you know, they're thinking, well, if I can get him to say something about Arsenal... That's going to generate headlines. It's going to generate clicks. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe that's it. You know. I don't know. I don't know for a fact that that's what's happening. But I do wonder. You know, we are Arsenal are just such a uh, we're 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 box office. We may not be good, but we're box office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of goalkeepers, um, yes. we have a question from Roy Habib, who's at Oi Thirty Five. He says. I remember when Petr Cech almost passed the ball into his own goal. Leno's previous team were tweeting that he was a modern keeper with the capability of playing the ball with his feet. Now he's considered not good enough to play from the back. Thoughts? And then uh, there's a follow-up question or a different question from Josh, who's at Josh Robinson 87 who says, who are you picking in goal against Norwich, Leno or Ramsdale? 
Yeah, I really like this question from George Stevens, who just said, true or false, Aaron Ramsdale? <laughs> Which, uh, that was the whole question. Um, I think... <laughs> true. <laughs> true. True, he is. Uh, he is Aaron he Ramsdale. Is, he is a true man. Yeah, I think it's an interesting point about the Leno... You know, was it Schalke saying, oh, they've got a good goalkeeper who can Leverkusen. play with his feet? Bar Leverkusen. 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 Right, yeah. Um, that's an interesting point, isn't it? Has playing out from the back evolved so dramatically in the space of three years, <laughs> three years <laughs> that Leno has been left behind um, by the pace of change? I suspect not. I suspect that playing out from the back is only 50% about actual technical ability and kicking the ball. I suspect that a huge percentage of it is psychological and tactical. So understanding when you should do it and when not, mm. following the patterns, and also having the conviction, shall we say, the confidence to follow through on that. I think that, I doubt very much there is a great deal between how well Leno and Ramsdale can strike a ball on the training ground. I'd be surprised if there's a gulf in quality because, you know, mm. partly because of what we're seeing about Leverkusen saying he could do it in Germany and these kinds of things. I just wonder if it's that second part where Leno is struggling at the moment and yeah. where Ramsdale maybe with the confidence of youth may be less inhibited I don't know yeah I think I said this last week that's right maybe I, I think there, there there is certainly um there's certainly there's an element of, component of course of course and look you know when you're comparing Petr Cech with the ball at his feet and Bern Leno with the ball at his feet mm. you know Cech looked like he was wearing clown shoes in comparison it's like the evolution to Leno. of man diagram, isn't it? You know, <laughs> we're hoping that Ramsdale's like the <laughs> Ramsdale can walk upright and everything. Wow. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. <laughs> but uh, Spin is there, hunched over. <laughs> little Al Mooney uh, of fish coming out of the sea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, please I'm, make that someone. Please do that on Photoshop. I'd really enjoy. Oh my god, that would be amazing. <laughs> I think. Um, there's a confidence element in it for sure, for sure. Yeah. And for whatever reason, whether it's in himself and maybe in some part the players in front of him, like I don't think Leno has helped a couple of the guys with some of his passes. Yeah. Nevertheless. He's not had Ben White to give it to, really. No, but like, I games. mean, if you're Bernd Leno, how many times can you give the pass to Granit Xhaka and see him get pickpocketed from behind mm. without suffering some kind of residual traumatic stress disorder from that mm. very incident. Here's Xhaka going, give me the ball, give me the ball. Oh, are you sure? Okay, mm. I'll give you the ball. And Xhaka, you know, doesn't spot the eight players congregating around him, all coming from different angles, like fighter mm. pilots to his slow-moving mm. fucking aircraft carrier, you know. Um so maybe there's an element of that, but it does feel a bit like we have gone way too far away from what Mikel Arteta wants from his goalkeeper. So whether Leno can get it back or whether um, Ramsdale comes in, I, I don't quite know. But I mean, what would you do? What What do you think, Mikel Arteta? Because what we would do is neither here nor there. But what do you think Mikel Arteta will do for um, for Norwich? <sighs> I think it's a really tricky one, actually, you know. I think it's quite finely balanced. I think that, you know, Ramsdale, Ramsdale played, of course, in the behind-closed-door game, and they'll have had another look at him there. I think he's got a chance for Saturday. Um, I, but, I, you know, I, I guess it's because we've had the break. And it's like potentially, you know, we spoke about wanting to get those signings in the team and have a fresh uh, look about mm. it. I think that could go in his favour, but, you know, Leno's going to come back from international duty and they'll have a decision to make. I, if I had to put money on it, I think he'll stick with Leno. I think he'll stick with Leno just about. 
Mm. But I think we're so, I think we're close to a change. I, yeah. I, I think we're not far off. I, I think if you, if you do it this early in the season to Leno after like a couple of defeats where yeah, yeah. I don't think you can really put much of it on the goalkeeper himself. I, I, you know, I don't think he was particularly great in the Brentford game. To be honest, that that second goal didn't really reflect well on him. And I know there was criticism of him for the first goal against Man City where he looked like he was going to come and then didn't. Yeah. Um, but I don't think you can really blame a goalkeeper for defeats against Chelsea and Man City. And it feels like you kind good of... He saves in both those games. Yeah, he did. And you're kind of crossing the Rubicon a little, aren't you, if you make that change this early? Mm -hmm. Like, basically, you're saying the baton has been passed. You are now going to sit for yeah. an entire season. Does that then not create the competitive environment that you want? Like, you want Ramsdale really pushing Leno. That's what you True. want. Whereas if you give it to Ramsdale right now, like is, and this isn't to sort of um, besmirch Leno or his professionalism or anything like that, but is he going to be motivated to win his place back or is he just going to go, well, I'm going to go next summer anyway. Fuck it. Yeah, it might be a bit much, mm. might it, the week after the transfer deadline to go, <laughs> oh, by the way, you're out. Yeah. I mean... Do you think there's any way, if something Manchester United did a bit last season, and I don't have the numbers on this, so someone would need to, someone needs to check, and I'll be honest, I'm not going to. But I think <laughs> they occasionally um, would leave David De Gea out to in the league to give a game, like two or three times in the course of the Premier League season, they gave a game to, um, who's the young fellow? Henderson. The guy they got, Hen Hen Dean Henderson, yeah. So I think, like, it wasn't that De Gea was dropped. It was just, we've got two goalkeepers and we rotate one in here mm. and there. Do you think Arsenal will do that at any point? Like, is there the possibility that you could think, well, this is a good game to give Ramsdale a league debut? We'll do it. It doesn't mean Leno's out in the cold. It's just... Yeah, sort of competition and keeping one on their toes. I guess it depends how confident you are in... in in making that decision and does it have an impact on the mm. team and the way that it plays? Like if Ramsdale comes in and is like knocking it about at the bank, like <laughs> yeah, fucking... Sure. Cesc Fabregas yeah, through balls. Exactly. You know, he's... Rabonas, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's doing all that. And then you bring in Leno, who's just going to clump it down downfield. You know, but this, I think this all comes back to what we want from... Um, from... Uh, the team in terms of how it plays and how it improves. Mm. You know, it ties into that. Like the 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 style of play, so to speak, is not going to win too many awards um, right now, is it? You know, so we need to we need to be playing better football. So maybe that in some way informs your decision about the goalkeeper as well. If you think they're both good shot stoppers, but you think one is better at you know, distributing the ball from from the back or keeping the ball at the back or doesn't put his defenders under as much pressure, that could be the key factor. That could be the key factor, but I do think it's probably still a little bit too early. So, Yeah, I, I think that it's not impossible, given, you know, we don't have European football, that there might be games where Ramsdale sort of gets a go mm. in the Premier League as a kind of test that doesn't necessarily mean Leno's out in the cold. I, I think it will be... Leno uh, for now I think you've got to give him the chance with better players in front of him I mean look he can't give it to Kolasinac short do you know what I mean I'm not joking like he, he can't you know it's not a serious option mm. like if you give him a back four of Tommy Asu White Gabriel Tierney yeah and he's still kicking it 70 yards at Bukayo Saka's head because he scored one header for England, <laughs> then I think then maybe we have to change it. Yes. I think I think Leno's probably not quite you know done enough to deserve being dropped. I frankly. think that's fair. I think that's fair. Um, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I, like I say, I do think there is a call there, I, 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 and I, I'm sure it'll be a discussion at mm. the training ground. What about this? Uh, BH14, I think his name is Ben, said, um, what happens to Enketia and Balogun now? I don't realistically see them getting much game time. 
And is this an indictment on Edu's youthful core philosophy? Our growing inability to manage talent already at the club is a big concern. Great question. And I don't know. I genuinely, I don't know. I mean, I, I really feel, and I think you said it last week, that uh, you really wanted Eddie to leave. To because, get his move, To yeah. get his move, j- just because he needs to play. Um, he is now in an awkward position because maybe some of the minutes that we thought we might be able to give to Balagoon, and Keddie is kind of, um, he's, he's more experienced, um, but he's going to leave in a year or less than a year, you know, do you completely sideline him? I mean, what's the point in giving Eddie minutes that you could Mm -hmm. give to Balogun? They're much more beneficial to Arsenal, or it is more beneficial to Arsenal for Balogun to get minutes than it is for Enkedia to get minutes, if you think that they are, you know, more or less the same in terms of talent like if Enkedia was miles miles better than Balagoon you'd say well you know to 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 get the results we can play uh, we can play Eddie even if he is going to leave but I don't think that's the the case that's the dynamic is that your dog yeah I better go and just calm her down she's on her own in the living room and she oh, no, seems to be giving very out. sad about that she does. give me one minute and I'll come back yeah no problem great bow come on I've explained to Belle that I'm I, doing a podcast. I heard you. I heard you explain that. You can me, leave yeah. that in. Um, <laughs> you can leave that in. I've, I've reasoned with her. If that doesn't work, I don't know what will. That's um, what dogs uh, react to best. <laughs> it's just rational explanation in a language yeah. they don't Listen, understand. Listen, I understand. You're stressed. You're lonely. You're sad. <laughs> I am doing a podcast, okay? You should subscribe, <laughs> by the way. You're supposed to be an Arsenal fan. Yeah. Um, what were we saying? And we're talking and about Balogun. and Kenny and Balogun, and like it's a weird one, isn't yeah. it? Like, so Eddie Nketiah has got a year to run. My understanding mm. is that if he if he leaves for nothing, or if he leaves on a Vertcom's free transfer at the end of that, Arsenal will be due compensation. It's not quite the case that they get nothing if he goes um, to another English club. I don't know if correct. that's the case if he goes to. Yeah, know, I think that's somewhere right. Else. Training compensation for a move to a British club. Um, so he's in a real kind of strange no man's land. The only thing that makes me think he'll be okay is that Mikel Arteta has been consistently very positive about Eddie and Ketia, and um, I'm not sure I necessarily see that changing. I think he, but 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 even so, mm. without European football. When's he going to play? I well, mean, yeah. that's one of the interesting things about Lacazette. You know, they're talking about Lacazette as one of these five important players. Is he going to play a lot? I don't know. I don't know either. I don't know. I mean, that was, that was, that was, it was always difficult to see where Balagoon was going to get minutes if Lacazette stayed in particular because yeah. we've only got 38 games. Uh, so, barring an injury problem or, you know, uh, something else, suspensions or whatever it might be. I mean, as we saw on the opening day of the season, he started because neither Aubameyang or Lacazette were available because they had COVID. Yeah. So, um, and maybe that situation influenced plans a little bit. I don't know, but I don't get that impression. I mean, Balogun should be out on loan. Really. I think so, yeah. I think I'm surprised that that didn't happen in the outgoing part of the, the window. Um yeah. I mean, he didn't even start against West Brom. You well, know? yeah, and your 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 point earlier about Tammy Abraham. Yeah, where did he go? He went to Bristol Rovers. He went to West Brom. Was Villa. it Vill- Aston Villa. Villa when they were in the championship? Yeah. So mm-hmm. you know, he went and played full seasons at 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 uh, at decent clubs and scored a lot of goals. Mm-hmm. Scored a lot of goals. Those goals got him his chance at Chelsea. And ultimately, those goals got him his move to to Roma. So yeah, it is a strange one for Balagoon because I don't know how much he is going to play if Aubameyang stays fit and and scores goals. 
So no, I, I agree, and you know, people sort of scoffed. Sheffield United paid a lot of money for Ian Brewster. I don't know if you remember from Liverpool, and he, he didn't get a goal for them in the Premier League last season. They paid twenty three million pounds, something like mm. that. But the reason they did that is that Brewster had gone out on loan to Swansea. And been really, really impressive uh, for them. I think he scored, here you go, 11 in 22 at Swansea in the championship. You, can I ask you a question? I don't know if you know or not, but we do have a, a loan manager. Ben Napa. Uh, yeah, yeah, at the club. So that's his entire job. But but is his role specific to um, keeping tabs on the players uh, that we have out on loan? Or is he in any way involved in trying to find clubs for players we are looking to loan out? Or yeah, is- no, he is. He is. And he's about, you know, all, all that stuff you hear about trying to find the right stylistic match and things like mm. that. You know, that would come under his remit, certainly. Um, I, I think in the case of Balogun, there's never been any any indication for the club that he was available for loan. Um you know, they've said since he signed the contract, they seem as a big part of the plans for going to be mm. with the first team. He got his promotion, got his squad number, all that stuff. But just looking at it from where I'm stood, I don't see, especially with Nketiah there, how he's going to get enough game time to really push on. He's too mm. good for under-23 football at this point. And they've um, brought in a kid, haven't they? The the young lad from uh, BRF, Fulham, yeah. from Fulham yeah, yeah. who was in the, in the under-23 team because Balogun has made the step up to the first team. So... Look, I'd like yeah. to see him get more minutes and get some playing time for us. And, you know, if we're, you know, imagine a crazy, crazy scenario where we're winning comfortably against Norwich on Saturday or Sunday. I'm sure, you Saturday. Have some, Saturday I think, Andrew, it's a Saturday 3 p.m. kickoff. Oh, my goodness. I know. That is, uh, that is uh, streaming territory, of course. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, if we're in a, a situation where we're a few goals up and, you know, you want to give a young player some minutes, that's the ideal scenario. So if that's the situation, let's imagine we've got on the bench, Lacazette, Balagoon is on the bench because you can have nine subs now. Mm. Like, where do you want to see those minutes go? On a oh, guy? I want to see them go to Balagoon, Balagoon certainly. Yeah. Like, you don't want to see him... Like, with the, yeah. So with all due respect to Eddie, if he's not going to be around, we have to make the investment in the players who are. So I don't want to see Lacazette because we've seen him and we know what he can do and can't do. uh, And he's going to leave next summer. So in situations like this, I think this is going to be an interesting aspect of of Mikel Arteta's management. Uh, Mm -hmm. I know he has to play this, this game, this balancing game where like... If Lacazette keeps getting passed over as a substitute for Balogun, mm. uh, he's not going to be happy. And senior players, when they're not happy, can be problematic. So he does have to try and strike a balance in in terms of keeping people happy because that's part and parcel of the job, whether people like it or not. But I yeah. want to see Balogun get the minutes because that is an investment in a player who's 20 years of age. We've given him a new contract. We obviously believe in his, his potential and his talent. And... Um, yeah, give him those minutes. Don't give them to Eddie. Um, again, though, you could make a case that if we're going to try and sell Eddie or loan him or whatever, maybe it's a bit too late for that now, but, you know, some shop window football for, for Eddie, who looked quite sharp in preseason, in fairness. Um, yeah, he did. You know, but this is this is what we've got to do to try and build for the future. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and in fairness to the club, what they tried to do with Eddie, which is basically what they've done with Reese Nelson, you know, the, the one-year extension plus a loan somewhere that could have increased his value, uh, it's not in itself a bad idea. It's just that he wasn't up for that at this point. And I think, you know, the time for that was probably last summer or even the previous January transfer window. Um, and mm. that ship seems to have sailed. We did talk about this at the time where mm. that situation with Balagoon, when it looked like his contract was yeah, going to run yeah. down, Balagoon and Enkedia have the same agent. Mm-hmm. So in order to get Balagoon to sign a new contract, we've obviously had to give him and that agent some assurances about playing time time. or how he's viewed his development what the plan is for him and it strikes me 
that the detail of that is probably at odds with Eddie and Keddie's existence, if you like. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. therefore, it becomes very difficult to convince Enkedia to sign a loan or sign a contract extension so he can loan him out because he already knows. Mm. He already knows that, like, his race is run maybe at Arsenal. Now, maybe we're premature. Yeah. Who knows what might happen, but... Yeah, I mean, stranger things. But, you know, he's, he's 22 now. Um, he's not going to play a vast amount of football with between now and January uh, unless something quite extraordinary happens. And... Yeah, mm. I feel for him. I mean, mm. there is he could still go. Some transfer windows are still open, aren't they? Isn't there the Turkish window still open? Um, there's stories about Mohamed El Nenny have been yeah. floating around. I can't. Well, he got injured, so he's not going to go. And I, I just can't see can Eddie go going anyway. to to Turkey on loan or permanently or anything like that. So, um, okay, I think mm. we'll do one more very quick one uh, if I can find it here. It comes from George. C, who's at G-Man Sizzle. Uh, he says, it's been about 15 years since the Arsenalization of the stadium. The latest mm -hmm. players to feature on the montage wrapped around the ground are Henri and Perez. Which players who played for the club after 2006 would you add to the list and why? Wow. Henri and Perez. Hmm. Since 2006. Aaron Ramsey, I would have. Is he not because. up there, actually? Was there not, like... What, or was that uh, an advertising kit thing? I'm not sure. Not sure. But, I mean, his involvement in several iconic mm. moments yeah. uh, is enough to give him... The, the, the problem is, a lot of the big names that you immediately think of, their association with the club is a little bit tarnished in some way, shape or form. <laughs> Robin Van Persie, of course, would be one. Um Meza Ozil, Alexis Sanchez, none of them quite left on mm. good terms, shall mm. we say, which makes it very difficult. Santi Cazorla? Yes, I think he would be a uh, someone everyone could agree on. I mean, it's it's. I think it's a terrible shame that someone like Lauren Koscielny left on bad terms. Yeah, I agree. Was fantastic. I agree. Um Bakri Sanya was fantastic as well. But even uh, he got grief. Him, did he? When he went to City? Yeah. I forget now. Yeah. Yeah, because he didn't sign a new deal, right? He left for nothing. Mm. Um, it I seems weird to not include Cedric after the brace against Brentford in the behind closed doors friendly. Well, if you're having Cedric, we've got to have Shamak. Yeah. I, we could give them just statues, I suppose. You know? Mm-hmm. They're the next obvious choice. I think... Um, Inflatable statues. <laughs> Deflatable, crucially. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Ramsey is the one that I feel most comfortable with. What about you? I think I agree with Ramsey. I think Santi Cazorla would be uh, a widely accepted addition if such a thing were being made. Mm. Beyond that, it's hard, though. Like... Per Mertesacker, but you can't really do it when someone's a staff member, I guess. No, no, no. Thomas Arteta Eisfeld. would be very divisive right now. Mm. Uh, Thomas Eisfeld, of course. Mm. Um, ice, ice, baby. I mean, they're not going to do Ozil, are they? No. With all that water under the bridge. Um, the Jeff. I mean, Alexis was, I think, comfortably for me, like the best player I've seen in that period. I mean, it, you know, at his best, he was sensational. So you're talking about uh, the post-2011 period rather than 2006. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I agree. I mean, a phenomenal um, force of nature talent that I really feel we should have. Oh, I don't want to talk about the summer of 2015 again. Uh, just depress me, so I won't. But yeah, yeah, it was just sensational. And... You know what he was as well? He was fun. He was just mm. fucking fun to watch. Mm. Uh, I know he drove everyone mad in the end. Uh, I, I think including some of his teammates. And, and clearly it did not end well. I don't think it was an end that we covered ourselves in glory in either. Like no, maybe no. Alexis was difficult towards the end, but I don't think Arsenal handled that situation very well. But what a fun player. What a... You're like, he was... 
just capable of moments in games through the way that he played, the way he would just keep trying, and he had the quality to to kind of back that up. You know what I mean? So yeah, I, yeah it was great. despite that, I would I would sort of say I'm not sure that there existed between him and the Arsenal fans the kind of connection that certain players have. I don't know if there was always a slight sense that maybe he was kind of passing through, uh, or maybe he just wasn't here long enough. But he was here f- three and a half years. Yeah. So it was long enough. I think, I just think in, in terms of his kind of personality, I don't know that he was, mm. you know, um, like Santi as a character, for example, was very uh, easy to warm to because he had that lovable. kind of personality, yeah. very lovable, just infectious, uh, a happy guy um, who, who everybody could love. Whereas I think Alexis was... Uh, very intense in his work uh, and the way that he played, but a bit of a strange guy off the pitch, you know? And that's harder to to reconcile with. Um, mm-hmm. And it's difficult to make that kind of a connection with people when you're, you know, he's quite happy in his own world. You know what I mean? He didn't need necessarily to to have the adulation. I think some players want the adulation. He was, you know, he'd go home, and play the piano to his dogs and then go running up a volcano on his holiday. <laughs> and, yeah. and that was him. He was just happy doing that. He didn't need to be... And he lived in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> and he ate raw flesh. Yeah. And that was Alexis. That was know? Alexis. That, yeah. But that was just Alexis. Um, he did, yeah, I know he what you dig mean. a, a, a lair, a den... <laughs> And With his bare hands, And he'd yeah. burrow through the woods and forage on nuts and berries and things yeah. like that. that was, he'd appear that's at London amazing. Colney through the ground. He'd like His underground network would come up <laughs> through the field. Arson used to go crazy because he ruined the training pitches. Fucking pristine pitches and these oh, giant these molehills <laughs> created by Alexis Sanchez. Um, uh, but would he be an appropriate addition to the Arsenalisation? I think maybe more time would have to pass. I think the United thing, as much as it yeah. was very funny how bad he was for them, I think that will be... Yeah, that ultimately, I think... It's why, you know, Sesk couldn't go. Because mm. of the Chelsea thing. You just, you know, just can't can't shake that off. Tricky. Yeah. All right, look, will we leave it there? I think we should leave it there. Um, Let's leave it there. Yeah, yeah. It's pla- for an interlope. For an interlope, we've, d- we've fucking way. done done ourselves justice here, I think. So, look, as ever, thank you uh, thank you for listening. Thanks for being here. Later on in the week, we will, of course, have a regular Arse cast. We'll have stuff on Patreon during the week as well. We're going to do something with Lewis uh, also. Uh, so, uh, patreon.com forward slash Arse blog. Um, we'll do the waffle on Wednesday. And uh, for now, enjoy the weather. I'm going out to enjoy some of the weather as soon as I get this done. And uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Bye-bye.